Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Christensen. My pronouns are she, her. Well, and I work for Planned Parenthood North Central States. I'm also a member of our Solidarity Saturday Planning Committee. We welcome all of you here for our Solidarity Saturday for the month of May. Um, as always, this is a friendly reminder that this is a virtual space for North Dakotans to gather together and build community to become empowered and informed advocates so we can raise our voices and support each other and our work for justice and equity in this state. Um, I would like to give a big shout out to the planning uh, team before we dump, jump in here. Amy Jacobson with Prairie Action, Andrew Bouchaw with ND AFL CIO, Cody Schuler with ACLU ND, Carrie Brecker with Moms Demand Action, and Madison Ziegler, um, a colleague of mine at Planned Parenthood. A few of our planning team members are actually not here today as they're attending to other um, things in their personal lives, but we still thank them for their contributions. And just as some friendly reminders, to connect as a community, we really encourage you having your camera on so we can see each other's faces. Um, we also ask that you please keep your microphones muted. That helps maintain sound quality in our large group. We also ask that we please all be respectful and kind to each other. We can use the chat to connect as a community. And as always, it's really beneficial to connect offline outside of this space too. Um, so our lineup for today, we're going to start off with our icebreaker and trivia like we have been doing the past few months. We're really fortunate today that our keynote speaker is Representative Zach Ista, and he is going to talk basically about where we landed this session. So we were keeping you engaged throughout this session with updates as things were moving along, and he's going to kind of give a, a rundown on, on where we are. Um, and hopefully he can focus on some of the topics that maybe didn't quite as get as much information or as much attention in the media so we can be informed as we head out of this session. We have a wonderful panel of speakers that you can see the names up here, and they're all going to give updates on where we landed. And then we have some actions um, that we can take at the end as we say goodbye. Now, as usual, we are going to start out uh, with our icebreaker. Remember, we've done this many, many times where we like to share where we are all joining from. So uh, take your cursor, move it up to the top, and you should have access to a little toolbar. And what you want to do is look for this annotate feature and the stamp feature so that you can show us where you're joining us from um, either in the state or outside of the state. So go ahead and mark where you are. And then in the chat, we would love to hear an action that you took to stay engaged in the legislative session. So maybe you attended Solidarity Saturdays, maybe you uh, emailed your representatives, maybe you testified, maybe you kept up to date by reading the uh, newspaper and media outlets, maybe you sent a letter to the editor. Um, so let's share some of those ways that we stayed engaged and you can go ahead and write those things in the chat. Um, so we see a lot of people are joining us from Fargo. Go ahead and get those on there. And oh, we see, um, yeah, Representative Hager served as the legislator. Yep, that's a pretty big one. Um, watching committee meetings, writing letters. What else did we do to stay engaged this session? reading the paper, reading the email updates from your legislators, testifying, testimonies, calling committees, attending committee meetings, contacting our legislators, writing letters, signing petitions, staying up to date. Yeah, these are all really great ways that we can stay engaged. And it's nice to see so many stamps on our um, on our North Dakota state here today. So what I'm going to go ahead and do now is I am going to delete these drawings and we'll move on to our next slide. So in the past uh, few months, we have started adding in some trivia for us, a little show what you know. So for this one, you can stamp on the actual screen or you can write your answer in the chat and we'll see how we do with our trivia here. So question number one. North, North Dakota lawmakers brought forth a censorship bill, Senate Bill 2360, that aimed to ban obscene materials and criminalize librarians for doing their job. Fortunately, this bill did not become law. What stopped the bill? What prevented this bill? And the 
the correct answer is vetoed by the governor and sustained by the House. Yes. So our lawmakers actually wanted this to become law. Uh, it actually passed and went to the governor's desk, but fortunately the governor vetoed it and that uh, was sustained by the House. All right, next. Speaking of, oh, I got to erase your drawings, huh? That might make it a little bit easier for you to see. Okay. Speaking of censorship bills, House Bill 1205 and Senate Bill 2360 both aim to limit materials in our public libraries. If someone wanted to go back and review all of the video of these two bills, how much time would that take? So if you wanted to go back and watch all of the committee hearings, how much time would you need to take out of your day to do that? Um, let's see here. And the answer is 13. It would take 13 hours to go back and review all of those, all of those videos. Yeah. So think about all of the people who work to protect our libraries, all the people who work in the libraries and the time that they would, that they needed to put into, somebody put too much, thank you, that somebody would need to put into uh, monitoring all that work. All right, here we go. Next question. All right, so we know that this session was incredibly hostile with over 20 bills directly or indirectly targeting the LGBTQ community, specifically transgender individuals. Approximately how many legislator hours were spent on this topic? Um, and before I put the choices up here, what I wanna share is how we, how we calculated this. So imagine if you had a committee with eight people and they spent one hour on this topic, we would count that as eight hours. So it's the number of hours that each individual legislator put into all of these bills targeting the LGBTQ community, specifically transgender individuals. How many hours do you think that totals up to be? All right, and the correct answer is 1700 hours. And these are just the hours that are on the video. These are just the hours that we see in the committee meetings on the floor vote. This isn't the amount of time that our legislators had to give um, behind the scenes uh, on these bills too. All right, let's see here. All right, our next question is, so speaking of wasting time and, tax and taxpayer dollars, the Constitution of North Dakota limits regular session to 80 days. For a day to count towards the limit, one chamber must gavel in. How many fake days did our state legislature use? So these would be days where they didn't gavel in, but they still met, they still had committee hearings, they still got their daily stipend, they still used taxpayer dollars to work on um, legislative work, but they were they technically didn't count towards those 80 days. And the answer is, it's a six. And that was actually the last I checked was six. So there's always the possibility that it maybe went a day or two longer than that, but it was six. So they probably wouldn't have needed to use these six days if they haven't, hadn't been spending 17 hours on um, other bills that, that were really quite ridiculous and a waste of time. All right, and I think we have one last question for you here. And that question is, due to conflicts with federal laws and concerns related to harm, a North Dakota public school superintendent made the statement below, which district is this? When we see a conflict between federal law and state law, we are going to double down to advocate for our youth. We will not participate in anything that we think will subject students to further discrimination or increase their self-harm. Which school district did this? And the correct answer is the Fargo Public Schools. That is correct. So it was the Fargo Public Schools um, that recently came out with this information. All right, thank you very much for playing our game. I hope you all passed and did really well. All right, so next we're gonna move into our keynote speaker today. As I mentioned earlier, we're very fortunate to have Representative Zach Ista with us. He has served in District 43 in Grand Forks since 2020. 
Zach has been a member of the House Finance and Taxation Committee, along with the Natural Resources Committee. Following the 2023 legislative session, Representative Ista became the House Minority Leader for the remainder of the 68th Legislative Assembly. While not serving in Bismarck, Ista works as an Assistant State's Attorney for Grand Forks County, focusing on child welfare cases. A representative Ista and his wife, Dr. Leah Ista, are parents of two young boys. If you have any questions for Representative Ista as, um, as he is speaking, go ahead and put them in the chat and we will share them with him as we go or towards the end. So please join me in welcoming uh, Representative Ista. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be here. Uh, I, I want to start with a couple of uh, of shout outs. First, it's, it's Mother's Day weekend. So happy Mother's Day weekend to all of the moms, everyone who provides motherly care. Uh, I'm especially grateful to the mothers in my life. I could not serve in the legislature, but for them, I'm, I'm the son of a single mom who is now a living grandma uh, in our house uh, between her uh, and my wife, Leah, they, they did a fantastic job of raising my sons in my absence for Bismarck. So thank uh, you to all of you on, on this call, on the Zoom, who do similar, uh, make similar sacrifices uh, for your families. And, and also a, a big shout out to all of you who, who were engaged and active as progressives this uh, session. Uh, you're going to hear a lot from other speakers on the agenda today about uh, this freedom restricting agenda that the extreme mega Republicans that dominate our legislature uh, advanced. Uh, and I know how much that upset you because we heard from you again and again and again and again, and it was fantastic. And what was even more fantastic is hearing how much it made some of my colleagues uh, complain uh, about their inboxes being inundated with emails from, from all of you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being engaged in that way. Uh, you're going to hear from, from others today about how the GOP supermajority tried to restrict freedom to uh, receive health care, to uh, restrict reproductive rights, to limit the types of uh, entertainment and drag shows you can enjoy, even to, to go after library books. And I'll leave that uh, to them to talk a little bit more about. Uh, and I want to highlight instead uh, some of the things I'm proud of. Our, our Democratic NPL caucus, uh, only 12 of us in the House and four in the Senate, despite those those small numbers, uh, we passed over 50 bills and resolutions that were introduced by Democratic lawmakers. And I'm so proud of that. And these really impacted the big issues facing North Dakota families, the ones we heard about on the campaign trail, the ones that impact your daily lives, things like child care and health care and public education. Uh, and you're going to hear again from, from folks in this call about some of those. So perhaps, uh, you know, I'll just highlight that I really think it was because of Democratic lawmakers that more children are going to be able to afford school lunches, more parents are going to be able to afford child care, and more patients are going to be able to afford the insulin they need to treat diabetes. And I'm very proud of the work uh, we did. Uh, as we go through some of the highlights, lowlights, missed opportunities, like Katie said, please drop any uh, questions for me in the chat. I'll try to get to them as we go. Uh, but let's let's dive into some of the big issues, and I want to start with workforce. We really heard a lot about that throughout the session. Uh, I think all of us that have gone to a restaurant, gone to a store, tried to get our car serviced, realized that we could use more uh, people working in, across all industries in North Dakota. So what did we do uh, for workforce? Well, some of the things our caucus focused on was how do we harness the power of new Americans and recent immigrants uh, to our state and to our country? And I'm so pleased that uh, thanks to people like Representative Hamida Dakani out of Fargo, Senator Tim Matherin out of Fargo, uh, we have new workforce training funds uh, that will be implemented over the next two years to train up uh, the next generation of new Americans uh, who, who certainly have a strong desire to, to enter the workforce and remain in the workforce. I think that'll be a huge uh, benefit to our communities. We also established a new Office of Legal immigra Immigration within our Department of Commerce, uh, and again, Representative Connie, Senator Mathern, and, and also Representative uh, Schwantek out of Fargo, Republican out of Fargo, really were instrumental in making sure uh, that we are looking at that component of our workforce development. And this is maybe a uh, 
outlier in a positive way uh, where we saw some of these extreme national uh, Republican positions infiltrate the legislature. We actually worked together in a pretty bipartisan way to uh, promote uh, immigrant workforce and, and, and retaining and attracting immigrants to North Dakota. So hopefully the investments we made this session will now pay off long term in our communities. Another area that uh, we focused on, and, and I have to give credit to my predecessors, Minority Leader Representative Josh Boucher out of Fargo, for really uh, drilling down on apprenticeships. Those have become a very important component of our workforce solutions. And Representative Boucher brought forward proposals both to provide scholarships to those who are, who are participating in apprenticeships and tax incentives to uh, employers for hiring them. And I think one of the um, maybe not so hidden benefits of these apprenticeships is oftentimes they're in, in good, they're good union jobs too. So we know the power of organized labor uh, and hopefully we're helping connect uh, workers to those apprenticeships and ultimately to uh, a good union job that they can stay in for, for many years. Uh, my good friend, Representative Lisa Mitzkog out of Wapaton, uh, made sure to bring forward $2 million for rural workforce housing grants. I think as we move forward this interim session and into next session, we're going to hear a lot more about housing needs. I know many of you uh, on this call uh, and in organizations represented here were involved in the North Dakota Rent Help Program, which has now come to an end for new applicants, except those uh, on the precipice of homelessness. Uh, and we're really starting to see what uh, it's going to take to move forward our housing needs in North Dakota. Our, our neighbors to the east in Minnesota are making really substantial investments there. Other rural states uh, like Maine are making very substantial investments in housing. And I think that's a, a, an area we're really gonna have to focus on uh, moving forward. Uh, transitioning from workforce, let's go to taxes. Because if you listen to the, the GOP majority, they, they would say their income tax plan was really the, the heart of their workforce plan. I'm happy to report that their misguided initial plan um, did not pass. You may recall that throughout the summer, Governor Burgum, uh, Republican leaders in the legislature were trying to advance what was known as a flat personal income tax. Uh, they style this as a, a modernization uh, of the tax code. It's anything but that. The roots of it uh, date back to the days of President Hoover, uh, for those of you that remember the 90s, this was Steve Forbes' big idea of a flat tax. We currently, of course, have a graduated or, dare I say, progressive uh, tax system where the more you pay, the higher your rates are. The majority wanted to end that. The plan they introduced called for a 0% rate and a 1.5% rate for everybody making above uh, uh, that 0% rate. This would have cost about $600 million dollars in lost revenues to the state of North Dakota. A full third of that would have gone directly to the top 3% of wealthiest tax filers in North Dakota. Top 3% of wealthiest got a third of the benefits. If you put that in real terms, that bottom 60% who got their taxes eliminated, they stood to get about $220 a year in annual tax savings. The top 1% of richest tax filers would have gotten over $36,000 a year in tax savings. 165 time greater benefit. Now, we as, as Democrats in our caucus, we push back hard against that. I, I, I spoke on the House floor. My colleagues, Merrill Pepcorn, Tim Mathern in the Senate uh, held the line on this. And I'm really happy that we did not pass a flat income tax. What we did instead uh, was pass a, a compression of the tax brackets. We go from our current five tax brackets down to three tax brackets. Uh, our current system ranges from 1.1% to 2.9%. The new system is a is three brackets of 0, 1.95, and 2.5%. Uh, that almost cut in half the, the price tag of the income tax portion uh, of the, the GOP proposal. It still disproportionately benefits the wealthiest tax filers, but we dropped down from that 165 time greater benefit to a 10 time greater benefit. So we uh, improved it, I think, uh, in meaningful ways uh, in that regard. Now, if I would have had a magic wand and could have influenced the final outcome uh, accordingly, I would have kept a, a 2.9 tax rate for families making a million dollars a year or more. That would have generated $30 million we could have invested in child care and public education and health care, things that I think are uh, higher priorities than tax cuts for millionaire families. Um, 
moving away from that personal income tax, I think another unfortunate outcome of this session was a big tax cut for the oil and gas industry. Uh, we had in place in law what was known as an oil tax trigger. Uh, this was particularly relevant last year. As you remember, the price of oil kept going up and up and up. Uh, we had in place that when that happened, we actually kicked up the tax rate we get from oil and gas companies by one percentage point. Um, some people called this a windfall profits tax, and to be clear, they, they thought that was a bad thing. Uh, I think it was a good thing, and I know it was a good thing because it generated $135 million extra for the state out of the coffers of oil and gas companies just last year. Uh, without oil and gas having to give away anything in exchange, we just eliminated that tax that got us $135 million last year. I think that was just a terrible policy outcome that is short-sighted and uh, uh, really could, could be a huge detriment to the state the next time oil prices spike. Uh, keeping, keeping on the tax theme, just on property taxes very quickly, you know, this was the type of tax that we heard from so many of you, from so many of our voters in our districts that was really uh, burdening families. Those property values go up, the tax bill goes up. So people like uh, Tracy Potter, when he was running uh, out in Bismarck, Merrill Pepcorn serving this year said, well, we should give a direct uh, tax credit to homeowners for their primary residence. And this was defeated in the Senate, but lo and behold, uh, it came back. It came back in the final tax package. And this idea that Tracy Potter, Merrill Pepcorn, and others had of giving tax relief to homeowners directly is what's going to happen. There's a $500 per primary residence property tax credit coming on the books starting next year. So those of you that are homeowners uh, with a home here in North Dakota, you're going to get a $500 credit off your property tax bill. You'll experience that for the first time in 2025 because it's coming off your 2024 taxes. Renters, sorry, I got we've got nothing for you in that in that bill, and that's a huge uh, gap we need to focus on as we move forward next session, uh, because we know that uh, you not only pay property taxes as a portion of your rent, but your rents are going up and up and up as well. So we have to focus on that. And to conclude on taxes, the last issue is is sales tax. You know that's more of a regressive tax because no matter how much you earn, you pay the same tax rate on those goods and services uh, when you purchase them. Um, you know, despite uh, supposedly being the party of tax cuts, the GOP did find the tax cut that they had to say no to, and that was on tampons and other feminine hygiene products. My friend Gretchen Dobovich introduced that bill, and unfortunately, the House decided it was more appropriate to uh, give sales tax relief for constructing grain bins than to women and their family members who uh, uh, need to buy those products every month. Thankfully, we did say yes, however, to a sales tax exemption for children's diapers. Uh, this was a this was good policy. Uh, it's one, however, that was held hostage to an anti-abortion agenda for years. There's nothing preventing us from cutting taxes on child diapers at any point over the last 30, 40, 50 years. It was only after uh, certain lawmakers got their way at the U.S. Supreme Court uh, overturning Roe that they decided, well, we better bring forward a policy that uh, we can say supports families. So I think, you know, that delay was unfortunate, but the outcome in the end is good. Unfortunately, they did strip out their sales tax exemption that would have applied to car seats as well. So uh, it's it's kind of a mystery to me where the GOP draws its line on which tax cuts are good and which ones we have to say no to. So I will, I, I will pause there if there happen to be any tax or workforce questions. I'll defer to, I think Katie was uh, moderating the chat. Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, I do have a couple. There's one question related to this. It says, do we have to do anything proactively to claim those property tax credits? Just want to make sure we understand what was passed and if it requires action to claim it. Yep, great, great question. So two reasons that the tax uh, was kicked a year to 2024. One is a cynical one. It made the bill look cheaper. Uh, it made it look like it cost the state less. The second one is it is going to take some time for the tax department and counties to stand up this system. So there will be an application process that will be rolled out in, in coordination between the state tax department and your county uh, assessor's office. So you're going to have to apply to that. There was a little money uh, included in the appropriation for, for marketing. So you should be inundated with messages on how to do that, applications. Hopefully, there'll be an electronic application, so you're not doing just, just pen and paper. But be on the lookout for that rolling out end of 23, start of 24. 
Okay, wonderful. Um, and we did have a question about um, some work that was done on the Natural Resources Committee. Can I move to that for you? Does that work? Please, yep. Um, so we're wondering, um, did Representative, it said, did you get an opportunity to hear much about the summit pipeline and you were, and also wondering if soil conservation is were part of that conversation? The summit uh, carbon capture pipeline uh, really was a focus of the Senate this session. Senator Jeff Magram from south of Bismarck um, brought dozens of bills related to that pipeline. He's now serving in the Senate and introduced those bills. So they dispensed uh, of most uh, of that, most of the bills he brought to uh, restrict the building of that pipeline uh, in some in good ways, some in less good ways, were defeated in the Senate. So it wasn't a particularly big topic in the House of Representatives. I think the uh, top level summary is if you are opposed to the pipeline, not much happened this session that will help that opposition. If you're supportive of that project, nothing was passed that will impede it. I think now we're seeing in Burley County, uh, that's probably where the action is moving now at the, the county and municipal level. There's a coalition of both environmental activists and uh, land rights and anti-tax advocates that are sort of joining together out in Burley County. So this, the focus moves from the state level at the legislature to the local level at, at various counties now. Okay, wonderful, thanks. Um, there's another uh, comment here, wondering if you could speak to Representative Boucher's success in passing a pilot of the pay for success concept. Yes, that's a fantastic concept that, that Josh Boucher introduced. When it comes to um, human service programs, whether it's mental health or child care or uh, developmental disability, uh, you name it, uh, Representative Brochet brought forward a program that says we are going to pay vendors for their success. So the company is going to come forward with an idea of saying, you know, we want to do this program. Here are the outcomes we anticipate uh, we'll get from it. And if they meet those marks, achieve those metrics, only then will the state kick in money on the back end. So really, it keeps the risk with the company to deliver on their promises. And if they don't, North Dakota taxpayers aren't out anything. If they succeed, North Dakotans will make that investment back into the company, but we've already gotten something out of it. They've, they've sort of had proof of concept, uh, and it's hopefully something that, that proves to be a good pilot project so we can scale it up, uh, not only in health and human services, but in other areas of state government, too. Okay, great. Uh, and the only other question I'm seeing so far is just wondering how you survived. <laughs> so I don't know if well, you want to speak a little. We do have about two or three minutes left for you if you want to wrap things up. And share absolutely. You know, it's. I think we all we all get that question and we all survive because one, we hear from so many uh, of you, uh, folks that are supportive of a more progressive vision for the future of North Dakota. Uh, you know, letting us know we've done a good job, letting us know you have our backs. Uh, we've got a great joint uh, caucus. I see Lori Beth Hager on. I see others. Uh, you know, we all have sort of dark senses of humor, humor, a lot of gallows humor, where we just uh, uh, make those jokes amongst ourselves. But we know at the end of the day, uh, there's a good, strong, progressive community in North Dakota that is fighting there with us. And the things we are fighting for are the families across the state, whether they identify as left, right, or center, or don't vote at all. Uh, it's important to to put up that good fight to make sure we're trying to move the state forward. And that's what motivates all of us to uh, achieve what we do and, and stand up for our values where we can't uh, get the, the majority party on board. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I know as somebody who was here in Fargo watching the videos and watching hearings and floor sessions over and over and over, you know, we have all these thoughts go through our minds. And so many times it was just really, um, I would say, heartwarming and encouraging to see people like you stand up and say the things out loud um, that needed to be said and that many of us were thinking at home. So we're just unbelievably thankful that you were there. Um, and I, I also want to acknowledge for you and for everyone else um, that, you know, our lawmakers back home, they have friends and families and jobs and young kids. And so to, to be willing to make that sacrifice and give that time there, um, it really it makes a huge difference um, for all of us. So thank you very much, Representative Ista and all of your colleagues for doing this very, very important work here um, in North Dakota and giving us some time on your Saturday morning. <laughs> oh, thank you, Katie. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna turn things over to um, Andrew Bouchaw now, and he is going to lead us through a panel, giving us some updates on different topics. Thank you, Katie. 
Uh, and thank you, Representative Vista, for that excellent uh, presentation there on the legislative session. We're going to dive a little deeper into a few issues that each of our organizations worked on. Uh, and so first up, we've got Allie Hoffman from North Dakota United. Uh, she's a legislative campaign organizer uh, and works supporting North Dakota United members, their union locals and their staff and building power to achieve success in, the legisl in their legislative advocacy goals. Uh, for North Dakota United, which is our uh, public employee and teachers union. Um, and a uh, little background, she grew up in Bismarck with her parents and young brother before moving to Kansas to attend Kansas State University, uh, majoring in political science. She's been working in grassroots organizing for the past 10 years in different states across the country. And Ali has been was working in DC with the United Nations Foundation before moving back to North Dakota and working with North Dakota United. Uh, take it away, Ali. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you all for being here on your Saturday morning. Um, happy to share this space with everyone. Um, I want to first off start by saying thank you to everybody on this call. Um, you know, we it was a it was a long session, but we did have some wins, and you know, we wouldn't have had those without our you know community and our allies all speaking up. So again, thank you everybody for everything you did this session. I know I saw a lot of folks saying they were writing in, they were calling. Um, so thank you for making your voices heard. So I'm going to talk about a few of our issues uh, we focused on this session. Um, kind of starting with the bad and getting to the good. Um, so as many know, our kind of big fight that we've been talking about um, all throughout the interim was on the public employee um, pension plan. Uh, we, coming out of the last session, there was a study that had to be done in the interim that basically said, figure out a way to close the defined benefit plan and move it to a defined contribution plan. Um, we have been fighting all along the way, but one thing we kind of, I think everybody on this call probably learned this session is that to many facts didn't matter. And, uh, this fight was basically lost on election day. Um, we, you know, no matter how many numbers we put in front of the committees, um, no matter how much we talked about the actuarial numbers that came from an actuary, um, a lot of folks just in the legislature just didn't want to listen to them. So they were listening to uh, the Reason Foundation and different groups that, you know, kind of had a vested interest in uh, moving this plan to a defined contribution plan. And that's exactly what happened. So unfortunately, um, the defined benefit plan will be closing. Um, and we know from other states having done this, that this is going to be an expensive uh, choice that they made. Um, and in a lot of other states that have made this decision, they ended up reversing course uh, once they figure out how much it costs, both in turnover as well as in public dollars. So we will continue to monitor the implementation and we will be fighting all along the way. So that's where we ended up on that, unfortunately. But like I said, it was lost on election day. Um, elections matter. So I think we learned a lot of that this session. Um, for K-12 funding, we went into the session asking for eight and eight. Um, and we ended up at four and four. So while that is a good increase, we know that our schools still don't have what they need. Um, they need more mental health support, smaller class sizes. We also are exp experiencing teacher shortages all throughout the state. So while eight, while four and four is good, we really needed eight and eight. So we will um, continue to advocate on, on the funding issue. Um, and we need to make sure, though, that it's not just our, you know, us and the schools and the administrators, you know, we really need community members speaking up and advocating for their public schools, saying what they need and saying they need more um, to make sure that our schools are receiving those, those, uh, the money that they need in order to implement some of this stuff. Um, for vouchers, we, we won, which was great, um, but unfortunately, uh, we won only because of the governor vetoing it. And his, if anybody read his veto message, it was basically like, this isn't bad enough. So we know the fight is going to continue. Um, so we are exploring options around an initiated measure or kind of looking at what our options are to beat this back um, in the interim and try and avoid this fight going forward. Uh, I know we followed it throughout the session. It ended up being only $10 million. 
Um, but from what we know, it's just, as we've heard a lot this session, it's the camel's nose under the tent. They get a little bit of money in one session, and then the program continues and continues to grow and taking more public dollars from, edu from public education and sending those to private schools. So uh, we really need to make sure we're figuring out ways to be uh, proactive on this instead of trying to fight back every single session. So stay tuned. Um, but again, we want to say thank you to everybody on this call. We had almost 2,000 members speak or 2,000 folks speak up through our um, alerts this session. Um, and out of that, it was almost 800 folks weren't members of the union. They were just community allies and supporters. So thank you for everybody uh, to getting involved on this fight because we really couldn't have done it without everybody raising their voices and saying we need to keep public dollars in public schools. Um, and then last, and I will wrap it up, uh, tenure, we had a bill introduced to basically defeat or get rid of tenure as a pilot program at BSC and Dickinson State. Um, the only uh, people that testified in favor of this was the president of Dickinson State and Representative LaFour. Um, we had many, many members speaking up against this bill because of you know plethora of reasons why it's bad um and we won we won once they tried to reconsider it and we got them to not reconsider it so uh higher education tenure is still in place across the state so we wanted to end on that high note so i will wrap it up there turn it back over to you andrew but again just thank you to everybody speaking up we couldn't have we couldn't have had these wins without everybody on this call so thank you again for being here and thanks for everything everyone here does Thank you, Allie. Uh, thank you for everything that your team is doing with North Dakota United. Uh, next up, we have Carol Sawicki uh, with the League of Nor League of Women Voters uh, talking about voting rights. Carol Sawicki is on the board of the League of Women Voters of North Dakota, currently serving as the treasurer. Uh, she's been a resident of Fargo, North Dakota for over 40 years and a member of the local league for since 1998. Um, during this legislative session, Carol was part of the volunteer advocacy team and focused on uh, a course following uh, 39 election related bills that were filed. Uh, she testified in several committee hearings and observed many hours of committee meetings. Take it away, Carol. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and thank you for inviting me and the League to participate in this group. Um, most of you know what the League of Women Voters is, but we are a nonpartisan organization and we focus on educating making sure that our voters and citizens are educated about what they are going to be voting on. And one of our main focuses is preserving voting rights. Uh, as Andrew said, we, there was approximately 39 bills related to voting and elections that were introduced this session. Many of those, probably most of those were either withdrawn or defeated. So I'll just talk about the ones that went pretty far or even, or got defeated at the last moment. Um, there was a whole bunch of bills about proof of citizenship before people could vote. And these, the impetus of these bills was problems that happened mostly in the primary in uh, Fargo, where people who had be become recently naturalized citizens didn't have that changed on their driver's license. And since North Dakota uses their driver's license instead of voter registration, they were not allowed to vote. And some of them went home and got their naturalization pa papers and came back and were allowed to vote, but some just were not. Uh, the attorney general was asked for an opinion about this and didn't come out with one until October. But at that point, he said the polling places, the polling workers were not allowed to question if somebody said they were a citizen. So this was the impetus for these bills. The final bill that was passed about this whole situation uh, said that if a person comes to the polls with a driver's license that says they are not yet a citizen, and even though they know they are, they can vote a set-aside ballot. And then in the 13 days be between then and the canvassing board, they can go get their driver's license updated, bring that to the proper authorities, and then their uh, set-aside ballot will be opened and their vote will be counted. And theoretically, uh, they don't need a, an appointment at the Driver's License Bureau, and hopefully that will go smoothly, but we'll, that's you know, a work in progress. Um, then there was the bill about banning ranch choice voting and approval voting all over the state. Fargo has had approval voting since, two, uh, was passed in Fargo in 2018, and uh, was used in both the two, 2020 and 2022 city elections. 
And this bill would have banned that all over the approval voting and drag choice voting for perpetuity all over the state. Um, the, this bill did pass both houses of legislature, the governor vetoed it, and it originally passed with a veto-proof majority, but, and the House overrode the governor's veto, but the Senate did, several people changed their vote, and the Senate did not override the vote, veto. And most of, I think, the impetus of that was, there was a very strong letter writing and email writing campaign saying this, this is a local control issue. If Fargo has locally decided this, the state cannot make, should not make rules for everybody about that sort of thing. And then there was the story of the initiated constitutional amendments. Um, there's a resolution that it will be voted on by the public. I don't know if it's going to be the general or the primary that will increase the number of people who have to sign the petitions to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot from 4% of the population to 5% of the population. This a constitutional amendment that's being initiated can only have one subject. That's a sort of an iffy problem because who decides what one subject is? And then the most onerous part of it is that it has to be approved by the voters in both the primary and the general election. So it has to go through two different elections. Uh, this resolution being a constitutional okay. amendment has to be, uh, in order to be, get in, enacted, has to be approved by the voters at the next election. So we'll see how that works. But this was all an improvement, actually, of some of the previous versions. One of the earlier versions would have required that petition carriers have lived in the state for a full year before they're allowed to be petition carriers. And they're not allowed to be paid. They have to all be volunteers. And that's not that would completely um, eliminate, essentially, the, the initiated measure by the public. And there were actually two things that it, passed that were increasing, that were good things, increased the transparency for the voters. One of them was a bill that would require all school board candidates to file campaign finance reports. This would apply only to larger school districts that have more than a thousand students, but at this time, camp, uh, school board candidates do not have to file campaign finance reports. And then there was another one requiring that all candidates for any office in North Dakota have to file with an email address. And that just makes it possible for people to contact their candidates in a easy fashion. And also it's something legal good voters really wanted because of vote 411. I don't know if you guys know what vote411.org, you probably do because you're all active and engaged citizens, but this is something the league has been doing to make so that anybody in the whole state can look up on vote411.org and have all their candidates fill in information about certain questions so they have right they could compare them one on one and that was a fast and dirty explanation of voting rights in North Dakota through this session but i would love to, if you have any questions i'd love to answer them well th thank you carol appreciate it uh we're going to next up is uh Barry Nelson uh, with the North Dakota Human Rights Coalition. Uh, and uh, Barry's been a longtime activist and leader in the North Dakota Human Rights Coalition. And uh, take it away, Barry. Go ahead. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you for this time to be here this morning. I'm actually a stand in for Cody Schuler. And um, ju I just want to express right from the get go that the, the team that uh, led efforts to what ended up being fighting against some really raft of bad bills is powerful and mighty. Um, it's be between Cody and North Dakota Human Rights Coalition and Christina Sambor and Faye Seidler and so many other people. It's just a, a powerful group that's going to go forward that will continue this fight. So as we've already talked about, with over 21 bills directed at the LGB and trans community, 10 bills signed into law, it begs these questions. How can a small percentage of a population essentially invisible up to this point throw a legislative body and a governor into a moral panic? How can bills which are showing up in dozens of states around the country show up here to address problems that do not exist for our state? And how can a political party which exists on the premise of small government, decentralized local control intrude into every aspect of that control, whether it's parent-child, doctor-patient, or teacher-student? 
hold on to your seat. I'm going to run through what many of these bills impacts are going to have. They were all bad, but they had unequal impact in terms of the children that we were particularly concerned about. First of all, was in the bill uh, regarding gender affirming care. 1254 bans medical care for trans minors, including surgery, puberty blockers, and hormones. Doctors can be criminally charged with a class B felony providing such care. Impact means that care is no longer available for minors effective immediately. There was a legacy clause, but it appears that has no impact on those who are already in care. Around restrooms and pronouns, 1522 provides accommodations to a transgender student in terms of bathrooms, but had restrictions on pronoun use. 1473 and correctional facilities, the youth correctional center, the penitentiary and dormitories living facilities, restrooms and shower facilities must be designated exclusively for males or females and reasonable accommodations must be made for transgender or gender conforming persons. Impact, institute separate but equal restrooms and showers, outs people by forcing use of separate restrooms, allows students to be outed to parents by teachers and administrators, and sanctions discrimination by denying use of preferred pronouns in schools and in state workplaces. And it's already been referenced, this is see bill that the Fargo Public Schools has taken a stand in terms of prioritizing the safety of their students over the awfulness of this bill. In terms of definitions, 1474 essentially erases trans and non-binary citizens from state law in the Century Code. Female is a girl, woman, or an individual whose biological reproductive system is developed to produce ova, and male means a boy, man, or an individual whose biological reproductive system is developed to produce sperm. Impact? On the one hand, it does not acknowledge non-binary people, trans people, and trans people who have had gender-affirming surgery. Yet, grammar is important, and the or in the list may leave open interpretation. Issues around vital records, 1139 declares male and female are the only options for recording sex on birth records and must be based on sex organs, chromosomes, and hormone profile at the time of birth. 1297, trans citizens cannot change birth records to align with their gender identity unless a medical provider provides proof of surgery. Impact from this might be minimal because currently, there is great difficulty already in being able to do either one of these actions. In terms of sports bans, 1249 means that schools are required to have sports designated for males or females. Teams designated for females may not be open to those of the male sex as determined by the person's sex organs, chromosomes, and hormone profile at birth. And then 1489 does the same at 1249, but does so for state higher ed institutions. In fact, it does not interestingly apply to trans boys or men. The point is there has never been a case in North Dakota that this would apply to. Um, and we all know that participation in sports is a very important part of development. So to currently discriminate against trans women. 1333 originated as an anti-drag bill and it restricts adult-oriented performances on public property or business frequently by minors. This was considerably watered down, so the impact may be minimal, but we will need to be following this long-term to see what is, how businesses will uh, impact this, or even having a drag performer a reading before children, whether or not that would be enough to concern certain levels of citizens. And then finally, there was a book ban. There was two bills, 1205 basically was the one that went through, which is maintaining explicit or excluding explicit sexual material from children's sections. So I already mentioned there's great um, collaboration in fighting against these bills. This is a collaboration that's gonna go forward from this point on. Um, I'm going to put into the chat uh, I ran through these so quickly, you need to study them more thoroughly. Faye Seidler has been a, a, a powerhouse of information and check out her uh, webpage here in terms to look at these bills with more impact. Also, uh, forward701.org is also tracking these kinds of bills. There are groups that will continue working on 
how to uh, challenge uh, the particular egregious bills, particularly the health care ban, um, rises to the top of that. So really quickly, I think I'm going to take a breath now, um, but certainly if you have questions, put them in the chat or contact uh, us going forward. Thank you, Barry. That was a very extensive list of terrible bills. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Katie Christensen uh, with Planned Parenthood is up next. Uh, go ahead, Katie. Thank you. I'll just give a really brief update on where we ended with reproductive rights. Um, it's really no surprise that an abortion ban passed in North Dakota. We know that our lawmakers have been incredibly hostile towards reproductive rights over the years. So as of right now, what the law is here in North Dakota is that abortion is banned in nearly all circumstances. The bill does have a few exceptions, and just the fact that it has exceptions really shows us that um, you, there's no one size fits all when it comes to regulating or managing um, abortion abortion care. So basically what the law does is it allows for abortions to be performed um, for ectopic and molar pregnancies. Uh, and we see that abortions can also be accessed to prevent death or substantial harm to the pregnant person. What's really deeply concerning about this and many doctors expressed was how close does a pregnant person have to be to death or substantial harm before they can access abortion. There was a doctor who stood up and said, we don't treat cancer when it reaches stage three or four. We try to prevent it from the very beginning or treat it in stage one. And so I think that's really highlighting that um, we're not terribly concerned about the health and well-being of the pregnant person. Um, we also see that there is an exception for pregnancies that result from rape or incest. However, abortion can only be accessed within the first six weeks of gestation. Um, if any of you had a decent sex ed class, you would know that uh, the first weeks of six weeks of gestation does not mean six weeks in, of time to access an abortion. Um, most pregnancy tests won't even show a pregnancy until around week five. So you're literally giving a person five to 10 days and that is only if they have access to a pregnancy test, if they have a regular menstrual cycle, if they have the resources and the ability to determine that they're pregnant, What's even more concerning about this is imagine somebody who has become pregnant because of somebody in their home. Um, there is no way that a 13, 14, 15 year old pregnant person who has been harmed by somebody within their close environment is going to be able to reach out and access abortion in that amount of time. So basically that exception is useless, completely useless. A couple other things we did see our state legislature give $1 million to anti-abortion efforts. Um, this is money that goes to a lot of religious organizations and also to organizations that pretend to be clinics. And ultimately what they're trying to do is deter people away from abortion by sharing information that is just frankly, usually false. Um, it's, it, it can be very stigmatizing. Um, and we see that these dollars have very, very few regulations connected to them. So for instance, if it goes to a religious entity, that religious entity can use their scripture, they can use their symbols, they can use their icons. Um, and there really isn't any uh, regulations on there about HIPAA or other um, requirements that medical clinics, real medical clinics have to follow. And the last thing I wanna point out is that the state legislature also passed a bill that requires an ultrasound video to be shown in all of our public schools. And the video that is being provided to DPI for free was actually created by Live Action. That is an incredibly anti-abortion group. Um, school districts can use that video for free or they have to use their own resources to go out and secure another um, video. So the anti-abortion sentiment is incredibly strong in this state and it is impacting even our public schools and our school teachers. And I'm gonna pass it back over to Andrew for our final update and to close us out. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so Andrew Busha here with the North Dakota AFL-CIO. Uh, wanted to update you on two things uh, that we worked uh, really closely with a lot of allies on this session, uh, one being childcare. Uh, we did have a plan where we were pushing to uh, for $150 million uh, for increasing the wages of childcare workers. Uh, that plan was not adopted, but we were also, uh, you know, happy to see that we did get some movement on child care uh, through the work of our allies and and other uh, you know folks that understand that child care is the number one workforce issue in North Dakota. Uh, they did uh, put forward 66 million dollars uh, for child care. A lot of that is going to uh, help parents uh, access child care. 
uh, if they are low income. So that was good. Uh, on the child care front, we of course could would like to see more and we would like to see that targeted towards increasing wages for child care workers, which currently make $11 and 20 cents on average. Uh, the other good news that we saw is that with, uh, you know, uh, on school meals, we had a lunch shaming bill that passed nearly unanimously through both uh, uh, both both chambers uh, in the legislature. Uh, that was uh, our good friend here, Representative Zach Ista, uh, championed that bill and brought along a lot of uh, Republican co-sponsors. Uh, and it, it's a huge step forward in terms of the policy on lunch on school meals. Uh, and then we uh, had, had an effort to get $89 million for universal school meals, uh, which was uh, spearheaded by uh, Representative Lori Beth Hager. And we uh, were unsuccessful in getting the $89 million, but we were successful in getting $6 million uh, for school meals, which would mean that uh, kids that are families that are under 200% of the poverty line will be able to... Um, you know, access uh, free meals, no more reduced meals in North Dakota. It's all free. So uh, that will help approximately 10,000 uh, more kids access free school meals in North Dakota. And, uh, you know, that campaign, we were able to to make that happen through uh, coalition work of a lot of people in here reaching out. We had hundreds, thousands, over thousands of people reaching out to their legislators on that issue. Uh, and we generated uh, over 100 news articles over the course of the session on that. So uh, feel good about that. More to come on school meals, I'm sure. And then lastly, uh, you know, to wrap things up, uh, the legislative session uh, is just one part of what happens in the state and going forward we have uh, an, you know a number of actions that we need to keep up the pressure both to hold people accountable to thank people and to uh, you know move into the local area where some of these policies are going to be being implemented so uh, today at Fargo there's a mom's demand action Mother's Day action uh showing support for reinstating the assault weapon ban that's from two to three in fargo at city hall uh monday in minot there is a request to fill city hall there is a five at uh, 5 30 the city council is meeting and they are uh, working to reestablish a human relations commission they've had both a lot of oh um sorry federal courthouse is where the bombs demand action is okay thank you um for that update. Uh, so in Minot, Monday, city uh, school school board or city council chamber in Minot uh, at 530, and they're trying to reestablish a human relations commission. Um, it, this is important. They've had a lot of like anti, uh, particularly LGBT people show up for previous ones, and we really need to make sure um, that we have a good turnout uh, to hold the city council members accountable and make sure that they vote the correct way. Uh, if there's any of these bills that you really support and you feel like they did a good job, make sure to reach out and thank your legislator. They went through uh, a lot uh, of work to get to where we're at. So we want to make sure that we're appreciating those folks that are standing with us as working families. Uh, you know, writing a letter to the editor is still a really good uh, thing that we need to be doing. Uh, the, the letters to the editor still help uh, put our message out that, that um, you know, the things that working families support and the things that we care about and our stand by our values. So as long as uh, we're on that, uh, we need to stay engaged with Solidarity Saturdays, attending school board meetings, um, you know, after seeing what, uh, you know, making sure that we're reaching out and giving support to the Fargo school board members and the administration for standing up uh, for the uh, federal law that's in place. Um, and, you know, lastly, uh, get involved with your district meetings and potentially think about running for office yourself. Um, we could definitely use more good folks in those seats out in Bismarck the next time we do this. So consider doing that, but make sure uh, that you get out and and uh, and stay active here and keep the pressure up. Thanks. And we'll see you on June 10th. Uh, you can follow us at Facebook at Solidarity Saturdays, North Dakota, and you can sign up for the Prairie Briefing uh, email action. It's a daily email coming from Prairie Action. Uh, the link is prairieactionnd.org slash subscribe. Have a great Saturday.
Kiss me on the 